I can tell. It's brilliant. My name is Lucy Eckersley and I'm a wildlife biologist and science communicator and today I'm going to tell you how I got to where I am now which is in a job that I really really enjoy but is in a bit of a weird area of STEM. I'm going to be taking you along the journey from when I was about 15 to now. So starting off, I am one of those people who really really loves animals, like any animal, like bugs, mammals, especially birds. Uh, and I really, really love traveling and seeing them in their natural habitat, obviously less so this year. We did a lot of hiking as a family. I, I'm from Manchester, if you're wondering what my accent is. Uh, so we had the opportunity to go to loads of different national parks like the Lake District and the Peak District. And we would go on hikes and we would play games like, you know, who can spot the coolest animal or the most interesting bird. And I, I really enjoyed this. It was really fun. We also had the amazing opportunity to be living right next to a park, which was kind of half connected to woodland at the back. And that meant that the bird population that lived there would also venture into our garden. So I grew up with loads and loads of birds around me and I knew all of their names. I even knew their calls, which I thought was really cool. Uh, apparently not, but you know, it's very interesting to me. I would also collect things, like natural history things. I'm not so bad now, but I do still do it. Uh, I used to collect any interesting conker, acorn, rock. I would spend hours in the river when we went on walks to a local valley, picking up the slate and assuming that if I crack enough slates, I will obviously be able to find a fossil. And that's honestly something I still do to some extent. There's plenty of cool rocks hanging around my house. Hang on. Like this one, this is one that I found on a whale's beach and ooh, focus, there we go. Can you see there? It's got some kind of fossil in it. That's cool. And I've got plenty of other weird and wonderful things around here, but thankfully not like bags and bags of conkers anymore. Okay, like one conker. It's a cool one. At school, I was decently good at science, and um, for a while, I was kind of okay at everything, apart from IT and music. I was rubbish at those. I was quite sporty. I did a lot of sport outside school. I did running, rugby, kickboxing, kayaking, loads of different things. And so I was kind of doing okay at school in most of my subjects. I remember people in high school talking about what they wanted to do when they were older, and back then, it was footballer or musician were the really big ones. Now it's more like YouTuber or Twitch streamer, which is fine. And everyone wanted to be something in particular, and I didn't know what I wanted to do. I knew I loved animals, and I knew I enjoyed watching David Attenborough documentaries and Steve Backshall on The Deadly Sixty, but I didn't really know what I wanted to do for a career for a really long time. I did really, in particular, enjoy biology, again because it kind of linked with my other interests and my collecting habits. I remember I did my Crest Award in biology in about year 9 and I went really overboard. I documented everything in our garden, I did like rainfall analysis, I drew out the life cycle of a frog and I also included a weird kind of like flip book of photographs of a squirrel stealing one of our bird feeders and talking about uh, invasive species and how they're affecting our native wildlife, I got really, really into it. That Crest Award combined two of the things that I really loved at the time, which was like nature, wildlife, biology, and being creative and artsy. I really, really liked those two parts, but I didn't really see how they could connect into a career. It didn't seem like school was making that a possible choice. 
One thing you do need to know about me at this age, 15, 16, I was really, really shy. Like, painfully shy. To the point of I couldn't do normal things and I would get really stressed about situations which made no sense at all. I would get the bus into school every day and to get off at my stop where I had to stand up whilst the bus was turning quite a sharp corner. And in my head I would play through all these ideas of what if I fall? What if I slip? Everyone will look at me. Oh god, that'll be awful. Everyone will be looking at me. It's not going to happen. And um, people wouldn't look at you and even if they did, they don't care. But when I was that age, I was just so stressed and so shy. I couldn't speak to people in public and the idea of talking in front of a group would make me feel sick. Obviously, that has changed a little bit and I will talk about that and how I've kind of made that change from being somebody who standing up in front of the class to read out a passage of a book would make me actually physically shake to now I do talks for thousands of people. So in year 11, we were supposed to do work experience and I was chatting to one of my teachers and I said, I like biology uh, and I think I want to work with animals. And she said, oh, you should be a vet. I wasn't really sure. I'd, I'd been to the vets with my dogs and cats before and so I kind of knew what their career looked like and I wasn't certain that that is actually something I wanted to do. But she didn't really give me any alternatives. It was kind of like vet or don't really know. So I said, okay, fine, looks like I'm gonna be a vet then. Because at that age, you start to think that the choices that you make will affect obviously the GCSEs you can take and then they affect the A-levels you can take and then they dictate which degree you do, which dictates your whole life and it's super stressful. I was already very stressed anyway. It doesn't really work like that. Obviously, yes, the GCSEs you take are important and every qualification that you do, you should try your hardest in to achieve the best that you can do. But don't worry. It isn't going to be the be all and end all. You have the opportunity to change slightly as you go through different parts of your life. And I did quite a few times. I was never really sure what I wanted to do up until like a couple of years ago. So try not to worry. I went to do work experience at the end of year 11, I just turned 16 and you have to be 16 to work in kind of clinical environments like that and I got to see some really amazing things, I got to see exactly what a vet and a vet nurse does, I got to help out with a few things, weigh some animals and various other things, but I realised something really important which was I 100% do not want to be a vet. Veterinary is an amazing profession and there are people who will be amazing vets and I work with loads of vets now in my current job, but I would not be a good vet. There was a lot of parts of the job which I just know I couldn't do very well. And unfortunately, animals don't just walk into a vet and go like, excuse me, yeah, it hurts here, uh, can you help me? They come in usually attached to a human who might be stressed or anxious or even angry. And you have to deal with all of that whilst also trying to help the animal. And I just knew that wasn't something that I wanted to do for my career. It was really important that I did that work experience to find that out. You have to do work experience if you want to become a vet. It's actually part of the application process. And that is because there are so many people who are suggested it for a possible career path, but then they actually find out what the genuine job is like and they don't want to do it. So I would always suggest any time that you can, I know it might be difficult right now, any time you can, trying even one day shadowing someone, doing some work experience, because then you can see what the realities of those careers are like, and it's so useful. So I decided I don't want to be a vet, but I had already chosen my A-levels, which were the ones that you needed to take if you want to be a vet, uh, which is biology and chemistry. Those are the two that you have to do if you want to be a vet. Uh, and then I had also taken maths and physics. But it also turns out that I had made the right choice because after my first year, so back then it was split into AS and A level, the two years, after my AS level, my chemistry teacher came up to me and was like, um, is there any chance that you could drop chemistry? Because you're like a hazard in the lab. 
I'm not very good at chemistry, unfortunately. I, I enjoyed learning about it, but I didn't really have a passion for it. And that meant that I would sometimes not really look at things properly or I'd be a bit clumsy in the lab, which you can't be when you're doing A-level chemistry. I would spill things or I'd end up like half blue or half yellow from various different chemicals. And so it turns out that that was really not a possible route for me. You have to do chemistry if you want to be a vet and I just wasn't good at it. But other than chemistry, I was enjoying my other lessons. I was putting in kind of the same amount of work I was doing at GCSE. I was kind of being okay in lessons. Maybe I wasn't really paying attention to the extent that I should have been. And unfortunately, I didn't do very well in my end of year exams after that AS year. I was doing okay in biology, but in physics and maths, I got Ds which I'd never gotten lower than a C before in anything, in any assignment. And I was so shocked. I remember I got the results via a text message and I felt so sick reading it. And I thought, this, I, can't, I can't carry on like this. I'm going to fail my exams. So I ended up starting my A-level year, my year 13, and going to those teachers, my physics and my maths teacher, and saying, look, I wasn't putting in enough effort last year. I know that I wasn't. I'm going to retake these different exams, I'm going to work hard, this is my plan, I planned out how I was going to do my revision, and I was saying, look, I, I swear, I am going to put this work in, I'm going to come to your tutorials, you're running a seminar this day, I'm coming to that, I'm doing all of this work. And I worked really hard, much harder than I'd worked in previous years at my school or the year before at college, I put in a lot of time to make up for the fact that I hadn't really tried in first year. And so I really wouldn't recommend that route. I had to retake every single first year exam for maths, which meant that I ended up doing something like 10 exams in the last summer of my A-level year. I was also working, like working to get paid, uh, in McDonald's, which honestly was fun. It was a laugh. I got actually paid for it. And it will make you really see all service industry employees in a completely different light if you work at somewhere, somewhere like that. So I would really recommend it. But after grifting for a year, it was getting close to my end of year exams. And I remember looking at career paths on UCAS because I still really wasn't sure what I wanted to do. I wanted to be Steve Backshall off of the Deadly 60, but there's not like a laid out career path for that. So I was just a bit confused. I remember typing the A-levels into UCAS that I was doing and it came up with some careers. And for a while I was like, I'm gonna be a nuclear engineer. And I chose that because the starting salary was really high. <laughs> then I realized that that would mean doing the mechanics bit of both maths and physics, which was the bit that I didn't enjoy. So I realized that maybe that wasn't a route for me. I was doing really well in biology. So I went to speak to my biology teacher and she said, you've done particularly well in this human biology module. Why don't you think about medicine? And I kind of felt the same about medicine as I did for veterinary. I thought it was maybe quite a complex, emotional uh, area to work in. And I wasn't certain about the idea of working in healthcare. I ended up applying via UCAS for biology. And it was kind of like maybe, oh, I could change to biomed if I'm interested, or maybe I could do medicine as a second degree if I decide I want to be a doctor. As you can tell, I really wasn't sure about what I wanted to do, but I thought biology would be pretty good because I was doing well in it. I also decided to take a year out because I was a bit confused, if I'm honest. At the time throughout college, as well as working at McDonald's, I worked at River Island Men's Footwear, and I worked at a tattoo parlour, which was an opportunity for me to kind of be creative outside of my science and maths courses. I'd been working pretty hard in all areas of my life for that year. And so I took a year out and obviously moved to Nagasaki, Japan. I worked there as part of an initiative with the Japanese Red Cross. And I actually worked in the Nagasaki Atomic Bomb Hospital, which was set up after the events of the Second World War, which is probably where you've heard of Nagasaki before. Now, I learned a lot in Japan, uh, living there on my own as an 18 year old who knew no Japanese when she arrived. Everyone was asking me like, oh my God, is Japan really like cool and random? Is there like Pikachu everywhere? And yeah, okay, there was some Pikachu. 
like, you know. And it was a bit random. There were some shops where I really genuinely did not know what they were selling. But there are lots of areas of Japan, including the kind of smaller cities and the less touristy places, which are incredibly steeped in cultural tradition. They're extraordinarily serene places. They're beautiful, they're calm, and they're quiet. And the people there are extraordinarily polite and respectful. And it kind of wasn't what I was expecting, especially in Nagasaki. I lived 200 meters away from the hypercenter of where the atomic bomb hit, and there were reminders to that event all around the city. It isn't really a tourist city, so I didn't really see anyone else from kind of Western nations while I was there. And there wasn't much English spoken at all or even written down in places, which to be fair, I shouldn't have expected in the first place. I learned a lot there. I learned, thankfully, how to speak Japanese and how to read the two phonetic alphabets. The other alphabet of kanji was far too complicated for me. And I learned how to live on my own, how to wrangle a washing machine, how to do a grocery shop, in another language where you don't really recognise any of the food. On my first day, I thought, I'll just play it safe, I'll buy eggs and bread and I'll make myself scrambled egg on toast. Uh, the bread turned out to be cake. And I learned how to be in a culture that wasn't my own and how to be respectful. But I also learned I do not want to be a doctor. <laughs> I worked assisting the nurses in the hospital who, in Japan, their job seems to be like everything apart from diagnosis and surgery. I did a lot of cleaning, I did a lot of taking green tea to the patients and assisting them when they were getting ready for different surgeries or appointments. I also spent a lot of time making origami with elderly patients who didn't have visitors. So I learned a lot and I really enjoyed hearing everybody's stories, but I realised I just was not cut out for healthcare. But that didn't mean that my time was a waste. I had so many amazing experiences. I traveled during my free time and I got to work with the Japanese Red Cross at a summer camp for kids. I also climbed Mount Fuji because I told everyone back home that I would. Uh, it maybe wasn't the best idea. I wasn't in my greatest fitness. Uh, I spent most of my time in Japan eating sushi and ramen and not exercising. And Mount Fuji is pretty big. Uh, I also decided to bullet climb it, which is where you climb it overnight so that you can see the sunrise. And it was amazing, it was beautiful. I kind of don't remember much of it because it was so difficult and I actually got altitude sickness at the top, so I ended up having to run back down straight after taking the photos. But it was really amazing. I also, when I got to the bottom, looked back and realised why people climb it at night. Because it's massive! <laughs> It's huge! When you see it in the daylight and you see that you're climbing up, it's a volcano! It's just straight up the whole way! It's ridiculous. So I'm really proud of myself for doing it, but it was also probably a bit silly of a way to climb it. But during my time in Japan, I had been thrown into so many slightly ridiculous situations. On my first day at the hospital, when I still didn't really know any Japanese, a nurse handed me a patient in a wheelchair and said something to me, and then walked away. I had to figure out where I was supposed to take this man, it turns out, to neurology. It was very difficult and I learned a lot about confidence and about how I can really deal with these situations. I was kind of thrown into becoming more confident and becoming more assured of myself. I couldn't be that shy kid anymore because I had stuff to do, I had work to do, and so I kind of had to get over it. So I came back to England and I went to study biology and I was at the University of Sheffield which I'd chosen because I liked the open day. Uh, it passed the test that my mum was doing which was she kept asking how many practical hours do you offer and if it was high she would use that as some kind of metric of oh this is good, this is a good university. And I also had been to Sheffield before at a free music festival a couple of times and I really enjoyed the city and I knew that it was somewhere that I would like to live. It's small enough that you kind of know where everything is, you can walk around the city centre, but then it sprawls into the Peak District, and so I could get my fix of being out in the countryside. So when it comes to university, this is my advice for you. Check out as many as you can. Check out their online stuff, if you can go to an open day, find out as much as you can about all different universities, not just ones that you're kind of recommended because Sheffield only popped up in my head because I'd been to that music festival and it turned out to be perfect for me. 
Also, when you're at university level, the courses don't have to follow a national curriculum anymore. You're not going to be learning the exact same thing as other people in other courses around the country. For example, I have a biology degree and because of what the University of Sheffield teaches in its modules and what its academic staff specialise in, I did modules like ecology, conservation, behaviour, conflict and cooperation in animals and all those kind of things. But my partner, who has a biology degree but from Queen Mary University in London, their specific degree specialised in things like human biology and pharmacology and physiology and biochemistry and microbiology because that's what Queen Mary University offers in its modules. So check out module lists and make sure that you're thinking about that when you're choosing which university to go to. I had a great time at my undergrad university. I really, really loved it. After Japan, I kind of decided that I got lots more done when I wasn't busy being super anxious and shy all the time, which sounds easier than, you know, it is actually to do. But I realised that I'd come to university, nobody knew me as a shy person, I could just pretend that I was confident and kind of run with it, and it worked. I slowly became this super confident person who can speak in front of crowds and who can do loads more than the teenager that I was. My degree was difficult. Biology has a lot of contact hours. So my reference beforehand was my sister who had done an English literature degree and she maybe had a few lectures and a few seminars a week. Whereas mine was almost the same amount as college and that kind of shocked me to start with the amount of work I was expected to do. I also had a job at a local rock pub uh, that sometimes my shifts would finish at 5am and I would have lectures at 9am. I genuinely don't know how I managed it but I did because I was working really hard and because I really enjoyed the degree I was doing and the modules that I got to do. I loved having the chance to learn from experts about cutting edge science. I got to learn about the genetics behind cooperation in animals, I got to pull apart different behaviours in animals and really understand them, and I got to do some really fun practical work as well. I got really involved with the Students' Union. I was actually a campaigns officer for the Women's Committee. I ran my own society where we got insects and we took them round to different uh, primary schools in the area, taught them about biodiversity. I was an ambassador for the biology department and I actually ran a radio show all about science. I also got the chance to do some field work actually in the rainforests of Borneo, which was really amazing. Before we went into the rainforest, we met in Kota Kinabalu, which is a city in the northern area of the Malaysian side of the Borneo island. And we met a guide and he told us all of the different ways that all of the animals and the plants and the environment in the rainforest can kill you. Like, the elephants can stampede at you, there are all these venomous snakes, there's spiders, there's leeches, there's diseases, there's this rainfall that's ridiculous. Everything there is designed to be super dangerous. And that sounded pretty scary, uh, it was a bit worrying, but I loved it. I absolutely loved working out in this extraordinarily wild ecosystem and learning about animals and how they fit into that. I also got to learn about conservation of animals and how we put projects into place and I realised that this is what I really really loved, learning about wild animals. True, I got covered in leeches and fell into a fire ant nest and at one point had to lure a forest pig away from our hut with a peanut butter sandwich. But it was amazing, it was fantastic, and so I realised that that is what I wanted to do in the future. So I went and I finished my degree. I actually ended up doing my dissertation, which is a big piece of writing and research that you do at the end of some degrees. I did that on Archaeopteryx, which is the ancestor to bird species, and it's kind of the midpoint between dinosaurs and birds. I compared the characteristics from dinosaurs to birds to see which it had. So for example, it still had teeth and it had vertebrae in its tail, but it also appeared to have feathers and wings. And I also researched whether it was capable of powered flapping flight. And so that is where kind of like, if you went and stamped a pigeon, it can take off from standing start. I was seeing whether it could do that. 
and it turns out it didn't have the necessary ligaments. It couldn't raise its wings past its vertebral axis, so behind it really. So it wasn't able to take off from standing like birds that we see today. What it could do instead is it could use those wings to glide from high trees. And we know that they lived in forest areas because of the fossil record. So it was really interesting to kind of elucidate exactly what this animal did. That was really, really fun because it was kind of understanding the origins of powered flight that we see in birds today. But I decided that although I really enjoyed paleontology, I enjoyed learning about wild animals more and I wanted to work with some maybe like more 3D fluffy animals. I was kind of done with the flat Archaeopteryx for now. So I applied for a master's degree, which is a second degree that you do after a first degree and it specialises you in a specific area. And I applied for one in wild animal biology that was run with the Royal Veterinary College and London Zoo. This was actually a really big deal for me and a really big choice to make because I was on track to do the combined masters at Sheffield. So that means that I'd be there for four years and I'd finish with a master's degree. I'd also saved up quite a lot of money working in Sheffield and it's a pretty cheap place to live. And I was on track to be an accommodation supervisor in my fourth year. So I would have had free housing, but I decided to take a really big leap. I knew that this was what I was interested in and I had to apply and cancel my fourth year of the Sheffield degree at the same time so I didn't even know if I was getting in when I was making this massive choice. Thankfully I did get in which ended up being a really big deal because I realised afterwards that there's only 20 people that are taken on each year so I was really glad of that. It was however a whole new area of challenges for me. I had to move to London, which wasn't necessarily somewhere I saw myself living, and I had to use up all my savings for rent and pay for the master's itself and start a master's degree, which was another step up in terms of learning from an undergraduate level degree. It was really hard work, but it was focused on what I really enjoyed, and so that really made it worthwhile. We did loads of practical work with the degree. So for example, every Tuesday and Wednesday, we would work in London Zoo with the keepers. And I got to do so many really interesting things like weighing the bush babies or giving medicine to the tamarinds. I even got to help out with the enrichment with the eye eye or with the wild dogs. And I got to see behind the scenes of a zoo and how much the keepers and the vets who work there care about those animals as well as how research on them is informing how we work with animals in conservation projects in the wild. We also did post-mortems, which I really actually enjoyed. Uh, I got to do everything from a tarantula to like a porpoise, and I learned the proper techniques and how to do it, and how to take samples from those animals for disease risk analysis. We also did field trips, including to a seal sanctuary to learn how to handle them, which is very cute. Uh, we did one to a wetland to learn how to track birds and to a protected area where we learn how to handle reptiles. It was all in all pretty cool, but it was hard work. I ended up doing my final project at the end of the year on the Scottish wildcat up in Edinburgh. And the Scottish wildcat is our last remaining wild felid, so member of the cat species. And it's super critically endangered due to loads of different threats, which included hunting in the past and now intragressive hybridization with domestic cats. So that means that they can hybridize, they can mate and produce fertile offspring. Because of that, recent estimates think that there may be less than 30 pure wildcats left, which is obviously quite a big problem. So my project was to look at cats that have been found dead across Scotland and I would look at their skin markings, so their fur, and I would look at the shape of their skull and take measurements and figure out if they were domestic cats or whether they were actually Scottish wildcats, or if they were hybrids. So here I used my skills that I'd learned in post-mortem, and it was a really, really interesting project, and I got to do some really cool things. But at times, it did mean sitting in a lab on my own with no windows and no internet connection, and measuring cat schools for hours. You do end up sometimes talking to them when you're in that kind of a situation.
But throughout my masters, I'd actually worked as a student ambassador for the Royal Veterinary College. I'd done that kind of work before in my undergrad, and so I got really stuck in very, very quickly. Actually, two days after moving to London, I was working as a student ambassador at New Scientist Live at the Excel Centre. So as an ambassador, I worked for the outreach manager at RVC, and she got me some really cool opportunities with different institutions. So for example, the Royal Institution in Mayfair, I got to do a talk there, and the Welcome Collection up in Camden, I got to collaborate with them on a project about taxidermy. I was getting really involved in this kind of science communication work, and I started to get interested in different areas, so maybe like videography or photography. I ended up getting to work with the London Zoo's media team after about 20 emails to them being like, please, I'd really like to learn. I got the opportunity to go around with their super cool and expensive equipment and take videos of the animals and learn how to edit them together to make something for social media. I then suddenly realised, at the age of 23, I know what I want to do. I want to do this. I'd learned so much about animals and science from both of my degrees and now I was kind of an expert in some areas of it and I wanted to tell people about it. And it's kind of what I'd always wanted to do. I was Steve Backshaw but without the muscles and the camera crew. I was going around talking about animals and wildlife and conservation and biodiversity and doing lectures and workshops to so many people. So that's what I did. Since then, I've been working at the Royal Veterinary College. After my degree finished, they actually ended up hiring me as a science presenter, and I'm also a freelance presenter. I discovered my favourite part of science. I was never really very good at the super academic side of it, so statistical analysis and writing and publishing papers, the things that you do if you are a scientific researcher. I was really good at the practical side and then condensing quite complicated science down into something that people outside of the field could understand. So that's what I went to do. In my job at the RVC, I get to do really fun things. I organise our massive like 600 people wide events that are open to the public, one of which included a flying display from a barn owl and a tawny eagle, which was pretty awesome. I do equine workshops where I teach people how to work with horses. We do farm days where I teach people about animal handling. And in general, I get to work with some really cool people. We often work with young people who may not be considering veterinary or animal science or even university as a path for them. And it's really amazing for me to be able to share these new experiences with those young people. As a freelancer, I do all kinds of things. I've worked with researchers out when they do their practical aspects of their research. So, for example, my colleague, Emily Madsen, worked out in the Maasai Mara, which is an area of a national park in Kenya, and it's where loads of really cool animals live. She was out there putting out camera traps so that she could track the movements of things like lions, leopards, and cheetah. And I went out, videoed her work, and now show it to people to explain how conservation works out in the real world. Hi, I'm Emily Madsen. I work for the University College London's Biome Health Project and I spend half my year working for them in the Kenya's Masai Mara, which is where we are today. I am going to walk you through a little bit of what a normal day is like for me out here. My normal day starts around 7 o'clock, which is when I head to the camp restaurant to have breakfast, which is usually pancakes if anyone is interested. Um, I stay at a camp that's actually for tourists in the Masai Mara. I'm one of the only long-term residents. So I see a lot of pe other people coming and going. Before I head out for the day, I normally have to pack a lot of equipment into the car, making sure I've got spares of everything. And always, when you're out in the bush, you need to check that your everything is good with your car before you head out. So that's my morning routine, checking the car, checking all the oil levels, checking the fan belt as I've had a lot of problems with my fan belt with my Land Rover, um, and making sure I've got no slow punctures, none of the tyre pressures have dropped, uh, because you need good traction, especially when it's been raining as much as it has been lately. 
There's a lot of slippy mud around. And then I head out for the day. So my sites, uh, I've got four different five different areas now actually that I work in across the Masai Mara. Some of which are community conservancies, some of which are governed, like privately managed, and some of which are community land. So I have to drive normally to some of these sites. It takes about 20 minutes to get them along the main dirt roads. But once I get there, to get to some of my camera locations, I have to often leave roads behind and do a lot of off-road driving over some interesting terrain, which is why it's important to have such a good car. So uh, with over 200 camera traps, it's quite difficult to keep track of them all. So I have uh, an app on my phone, which helps me navigate to all the locations and helps me keep track of which ones I have checked recently and which ones still need to be checked. I tend to check the cameras roughly once a month, so I'll visit each location once a month to change their batteries and SD cards. So checking each camera takes about five to 10 minutes once you arrive at the location. It takes different amounts of time to get between cameras depending on the terrain, but once I'm there, I change the batteries, I change the SD card, I check the settings, I make sure there's no damage to the camera, which is normally caused by hyenas, sometimes elephants and occasionally lions. Um, I tend to, the maximum number of cameras I've done in one day is 31. I tend to do somewhere between 20 and 25 though. Obviously, where we're working, there are quite a lot of dangerous animals. So it's not a good idea to just jump straight out your car. That's why I often work with the rangers. They help be an extra pair of eyes and they know, know the area much better than me. So we tend to give a good look around before we get out of the car, mostly concerned about buffalo or elephant, but all, all these animals can be dangerous when they're surprised. Another place we have to be really careful is when we're taking the cameras out of their cases. I have regularly found a lot of insects inside them. Sometimes those insects can be of the uh, widow variety. As well as finding widow spiders and cockroaches and the cutest animal I've found in my cameras are little tree frogs, which are very, very sweet. I have also very occasionally found snakes. So far, no venomous snakes. I've mostly had egg eaters, which are quite small, and therefore able to fit through the holes of my cameras. Um, but it is something to be very careful about, especially when working with cameras in an area like this. really hot around lunchtime, so I normally try and find a nice spot with a bit of shade and a good view to stop for lunch. Um, there's some places which are quite spectacular and I am known to uh, plan my camera trapping day around where I want to stop for lunch that day. If you want to know more about the Buy and House project and or about our other field sites around the world, then check out our website or our Twitter feed, where we're always updating with new photos from camera traps and, and what our latest results are.
So I don't know how I ended up here or what I'm doing, to be honest. <laughs> So we're here in OMC, and uh, how's it going, Emily? Car broke down. <laughs> I don't think it cares, Emily. No, look. Wait. <laughs> Grim, man. <laughs> I also work with George Hacker, who works up in Scotland and collects samples or bones or entire skeletons from animals that have washed up on the beaches around the country. This is us collecting a very rotten whale from a remote island in the north of Scotland. Just hiked, what, five kilometers? Mm. To find the washed up body of a minky whale in 30 degree weather, how is this Scotland? So I've driven out into the upper area of North East, West East, there's George, and this is where we're camping. It's my tent, that's George's tent, and that right there is the sea. Unfortunately, it's a bit of a drop, but still beautiful. It's a bad one. <laughs> oh my god, it's freezing! <laughs> that is too cold! <laughs> so I get to help researchers with all of this, this practical work and then I get to either video it or just tell people about it in workshops and lectures and on podcasts and TV and radio. I also do science comedy, which is a real thing, I swear. I was actually part of a group called the Talent Factory, which is a group of kind of like-minded people who wanted to learn how to do comedy, but have a kind of science-y twist to it. We learn, obviously, how to be funny, but also how to tell a story, how to have presence on stage, how to properly use our voice. And since then, I've done comedy about animals to thousands of people around the country. My teenage self would just never envisage this. I spend my time off doing animal photography, which I really, really enjoy. Again, because of my knowledge of animals and behavior, I've learned how to wait for the exact right moment and get some really cool photos even though my camera is pretty rubbish and my lens is older than me and was given to me by a friend, I still can make it work. And I really, really love going out in nature and getting these really cool photos. 
So you might be thinking, hey, I'm in London. There's nothing here but pigeons and squirrels. But you're actually wrong. I'm here in Regent's Park and we're gonna see how many bird species we can find. I've always been pretty creative. Like I said, at school, I was best at science and art. And so I kind of combined these two things into what I do now. I didn't realize that science communication was a real job when I was your age. And if I told somebody, oh, I'd like to be Steve Backshall and tell people about animals, I don't really think they'd have been able to give me a set career path of how to get there. I've ended up doing something that I really love. It was challenging at times and I had to really believe in myself and work really hard and sometimes I even had to kind of fake it like when I got to university and just decided to pretend that I wasn't shy anymore but now I've got here and this is who I am. I am super confident now. I have changed a lot since I was 16 but the things that I really enjoy and find interesting and fun have kind of stayed the same. Whenever it came to making a decision about where I was going to go, what I was going to study, whatever, I thought about, am I passionate about this? Do I enjoy it? And that really helped me make decisions that I was happy with and get to a career path that I really, really love. STEM careers are pretty cool. Now, honestly, they teach you so many things and you have so many opportunities to diversify what you do with those skills. You can honestly take it in so many directions and I know people from my undergrad and from my masters who are in all different areas because of those skills that they learn. I've also found through science that there are communities of people who can support me and who I can be part of. No matter who you are, what you like, what you identify as, there are groups in science that you will feel welcome. And there are so many inspiring and amazing women in the world of STEM that I feel super proud that I can call myself part of this group. I really hope that you've enjoyed hearing about my story and my journey to where I am today. And maybe you can relate to parts of it. Maybe you're not really sure what you want to do. Just know that there are loads of people out there like you and you will find something, you'll find your path. STEM is an extraordinary area to work in and I would recommend it so much. I'm now going to be answering your guys' questions and please do ask me anything, honestly. I obviously work for the Royal Veterinary College so if you're interested in becoming a vet, ask me about that. If you want to work in SciComm, ask me about that. If you want to know what it's like going to the University of Sheffield, ask me and I can answer. Thank you guys so much for listening and I hope you've had a really good day.